Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. That's a welcome from me, currently in France, not Oxford, and uh, from my joint convener, Sanford J. Unger in Washington, DC, to the 19th jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford, and the Las Casas Institute for Human Dignity, Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished panel and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A button and not the chat button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try to put them into, into a logical order and then put them to the panel to consider uh, during the later discussion. We urge you to ask questions as and when they occur to you so that there's no backlog at the end. So enjoy uh, the ensuing event. Now over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Mike. Greetings from the woods of Pennsylvania in my case today. And uh, very happy to convene an excellent panel of experts and thoughtful people on this subject. To introduce them just briefly, Liz Gardner is the chief executive of an organization called Protect in the United Kingdom. And uh, she's uh, a very experienced person as an employment lawyer and, and uh, now runs a, an organization intended to protect and defend people who take on a whistleblowing role in the UK and perhaps elsewhere as well. Floyd Graham, also from the UK and with us today, I believe from London, is uh, Principal and Chief Executive Officer of FG Solicitors, which is a law firm he founded in 2007. Uh, Floyd has an interesting role because he works as legal counsel for corporations and also advises them as well as people who are thinking about uh, taking a stand against the corporations or the organizations they work for. Sean McKessie is a partner at the law firm of Phillips and Cohen, which does quite a lot of work defending whistleblowers in the United States. And he was the first chief of the Security and Ex Securities and Exchange Commission's whistleblower office, a very important change that was set up, I think, in about 2010, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to defend whistleblowers and, and uh, to, to find out what they have to say in regulating corporations. Sharon Watkins is wears the mantle of a famous whistleblower herself. She was former vice president of the Enron Corporation. And uh, in 2001, more than 20 years ago, blew the whistle on practices there. And uh, she's at the uh, Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Sharon, I thought we might start with you today and ask you about the tradition of whistleblowing. Is this, this is not something you invented clearly in, at the turn of the century. Um, I suppose it was going on, I've been trying to think about some Shakespearean plays on which our other moderator, Mike Scott, is a great expert that probably in, in those times there were whistleblowers as well. I'm thinking about Julius Caesar and the whispering that goes on there. Can you tell us something about the origins of whistleblowing concisely and, and uh, how it's evolved? Um, very interesting question, Sandy. Um, you know, I, whistleblowing is a little bit of a toxic label. Um, I had friends say, oh, don't let them call you a whistleblower. You went to Ken Lay, the CEO of Enron, trying to warn him of accounting fraud. You were a loyal employee. You know, that's rat fink snitch. And then other people say, how dare you call yourself a whistleblower? You didn't go outside the company. Um, and it's, 
you know, it's just a toxic label. But as for origins, um, you reminded me of my small Tomball, Texas upbringing at Salem Lutheran Church, where we grew up um, going to a Lutheran school, hearing about Martin Luther, probably a pretty famous whistleblower tacking up those reformations against the Catholic Church way back when. So I guess I grew up um, with examples of speaking truth to power. And did you, when you, were, when you took your famous act at Enron, did you see yourself as acting in a great old tradition? Um, the, no, not, not at the, that scale. I quite often use the example of the Titanic. Um, <laughs> I uh, do have accounting degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, Hookham, Horns, and I um, had worked at Arthur Anderson in auditing for eight years. So I stumbled across this accounting fraud and really dusted off my resume look to leave the company. But when the CEO at the time, Jeff Skilling, surprised us all and resigned unexpectedly, it, A, told me what I stumbled across was probably horrible accounting fraud, hence why else would he be leaving? But B, you know, I'm, I reacted like a crew member of the Titanic, just running up to the wheelhouse to warn the captain, the chairman of the board, Ken Lay, that, hey, we've had an iceberg, water's pouring in, man the lifeboat, sound the alarm bells. Um, what kept me up at night before I met with him was just how I was going to convince him that, that first off, you know, he had supervised a company that manipulated its financial statements in a major way, but also that Arthur Anderson, a storied 90-year-old accounting firm, had allowed Enron to cook the books, um, and the banks had enabled it. You know, just how do you really sell this story because it seems so unbelievable. But I really felt like if you just get an outside accounting firm, an outside law firm to look at this, you know, you'll see I'm right. Kind of like go down to the bottom of the ship, see that water's pouring in. <laughs> it was a real shock to me when he um, ignored my concerns. Uh, Liz and, and Sean, I'd like to turn to the two of you to ask how, um, how common today is this in the corporate sphere? Uh, has it grown more, more popular for people to revolt against their employers and do this? Or is it still a very dangerous course for most people? Liz? Well, there's a lot in that question. Is it still a dangerous course? That's, a, that's perhaps a whole question on its own. But is it a common everyday thing to do at Protect? We think it is. We've, uh, we're a, a charity that's been supporting whistleblowers now for nearly 30 years. And in that time, we've dealt with around 45,000 whistleblowers. Around 3,000 people call our advice line every year. Um, not all of those are in the corporate space. And in the UK, whistleblowing covers you know, every employee in every sector. So we have whistleblowing about wrongdoing, uh, you know, safeguarding in a care home or exam fraud in a school, um, as well as those big financial corporate issues. One of the things that has changed very much in the UK is that our regulators now impose whistleblowing rules so that all organisations in the financial services sectors who are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority or the P or the Prudential Regulation Authority, you must put in place uh, really strict rules about uh, people at the top of your board who are responsible for whistleblowing. You must protect whistleblowers. You must train your staff and so forth. And that's really making a very big difference in the UK in terms of how whistleblowing is now perceived. Sean, uh, I think the concept of whistleblowing really reached a, a, a peak in the United States at the time of the, pen, the publication of the Pentagon Papers in 1971. And Daniel Ellsberg, the former government employee who decided to make them public and, and uh, reveal things about the history of the war in Vietnam. Uh, at the SEC, you didn't deal obviously with government whistleblowers, or did you? Um, I think, well, I guess the first thing I'd say is, you know, whistleblowing goes way, way, way back. And uh, uh, although the formal office of the whistleblower was formed when I was hired in 2011 to build and run the program that was authorized under the Dodd-Frank law, um, it, it, is a, it is a reality that uh, people 
reporting information to the SEC that caused the SEC to open investigations had been going on long before it, there was a formal whistleblower program. In fact, if, uh, if, if people hadn't come forward, a lot of the frauds that uh, the SEC has been enforcing since 1933 uh, would have gone undetected. So whistleblowing has been going on forever in the SEC space and, and you know, more broadly, as Sharon uh, uh, alluded to, you know, the, the concept of people telling truth to power is not new to and it's not unique to the SEC um, and, um, you know, has, has a long history of people, you know, we were taught when we were younger, you know, if you see something, say something. And uh, that's not uh, that's not anything new or, or, or newfangled. Um, I would say, you know, if the question is, is whistleblowing here to stay? I think the success of the SEC whistleblower program is a testament to uh, that. The answer to that being absolutely yes. Um, the program was, uh, as you said, uh, the Dodd Frank was passed in 2010. The program was up formally running in 2011, so we're about 10 years in. And yet the SEC has received tens of thousands of tips from whistleblowers under the program. Every year there's an increase in the number of people who come forward. Um, I'm proud to say that every year that the program has been in existence, we've had whistleblowers from every state in the United States, uh, plus uh, almost 100 whistleblowers uh, worldwide. Um, so the, the concept is here to stay. I think the SEC has proven that a program that has uh, protections against retaliation and rewards individuals for coming forward is 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 working. It's sustainable, and it's here to stay. And um, I think uh, to Sharon's point, I, I think and I hope that that program and it, its success is helping to turn around the concept of whistleblowing and the idea that whistleblowers are anything other than people who are trying to get things uh, done right and get corrected. I take a little bit of issue with the way you, you talked about whistleblowers revolting against their companies. In fact, in, in the vast majority of cases, like Sharon, whistleblowers try to get things done and taken care of internally. And then it's only when that doesn't work that people come and find people like me who represent whistleblowers to, to get to the regulators to get things resolved. Uh, these, are, these are generally people who like their companies, are loyal to their companies, want their companies to do the right thing, and only resort to blowing a whistle to an external party when they have been ignored or, or in some instances treated very poorly because they raised issues. Fair enough and an important correction, thank you. Uh, Floyd Graham, you are someone who sits a little bit on the fulcrum rather than on one side here. Uh, you advise companies, you, you must find yourself sometimes in a situation of your of, of not knowing where the best course lies. How would you describe that? You're on mute, Floyd. Thank you for that question. I think firstly, even if we look at individual countries or globally, we now live in a speak up culture and, and uh, that's visible across the world. In, in my role as um, a legal advisor to businesses, I'm always concerned about uh, not just the information, but validating the information that, uh, some, that uh, is connected with the wrongdoing that someone is seeking to expose. And, uh, you know, I take no issue with the right of people to, to speak up. Uh, it is essential that in the UK in particular, where there's um, a whistleblowing policy is still not mandatory, although I, I, I do agree with Elizabeth's position about public corporations and other entities that are uh, obliged to have whistleblowing policies, it is very important that um, the whistleblower is protected before the whistle is blown. So they have confidence in going to the right people and disclosing their concerns, which can then be uh, reviewed and validated before um, the whistle is actually blown. In the UK, in uh, where I practice law, the whistleblowing protection 
is only triggered after the whistle is blown in the, the sense that the whistleblower tends to be a creating career suicide um, or they get victimized in other ways and their the possibility of advancement with that business is now at an end so they're considered uh, to be toxic employees and while there is legislation from the employment rights act that will allow them to be compensated um, to an extent for that uh, it, it is retrospective protection uh, it is being mooted in the uk that we have the office of whistleblowing which would have an infrastructure for training and development but also a sifting infrastructure uh, that one concern about whistleblowing as it happens now is that it undermines and usurps the law enforcement bodies in their ability to validate that evidence before it is out in the public domain. Uh, and those are things that uh, do need to be addressed in line with the global question about can we have a global infrastructure to deal with whistleblowing I think some emphasis needs to be put on what happens before the whistle is blown. Uh, Sharon, Floyd just used the chilling term career suicide. And uh, I wonder if you felt that's what you were committing, perhaps not intentionally, but uh, whether that was a factor in the reaction to what you, what you did at Enron. Well, certainly I know of of no whistleblower that has got that label, whether it's deserved or not, that works in their chosen career. Um, it, you do become not so much blacklisted, you're just toxic. Um, you know, it only takes one or two people to within an organization that is considering hiring you to say, mm, goodness, there's a lot of noise around that person, a lot of baggage. Can't we get this skill set elsewhere? Um, and that one person and their naysaying is enough to keep you from, um, you know, working in corporate America, working in science and the lab, wherever you're, you blew the whistle. Um, Liz seems to be ready to make a comment about it as well in her defense of whistleblowers. Um, I'd love to hear what she has to say about it. Thanks, Absolutely. Sharon. And I do appreciate that far too many whistleblowers today get victimised and do lose their jobs as a result of whistleblowing. And I'm absolutely, Floyd's right, we need to update the law because in the UK it is a reactive law, it just gives you the compensation after the event and we need to we need to shift that, we need to move to a preventative culture where employers have to protect whistleblowers. But I do think um, you know, if we want to move the debate on, we have to stop characterizing whistleblowers as the mavericks, the outsiders, the people who are inevitably going to lose their jobs, because that isn't the case for all whistleblowers. Thankfully, you know, of the 3000 people who call our advice line, they're not the big picture whistleblowers that meet the news that have, you know, mind blowing things to disclose. But they are blowing the whistle up and down the country every day on small matters of wrongdoing that, as Sean said, they just want to get something sorted and they want to stop it. And in the UK, you're a whistleblower if you raise your concern inside the organisation to your employer, um, if you're raising a, a matter of concern that, that fits within the law. You can be a whistleblower inside an organisation. It doesn't have to be just the when you've gone to the regulator or you've gone to the press. Um, and if you look at the thousands of great whistleblowers who are coming forward day in, day out, to all the different employers, to all the different regulators. It isn't the case that it is career suicide for all of them. Too many, it is, and we've got to change that. But I just want to put the caveat that we want to normalise whistleblowing. We want whistleblowing to be a kind of everyday thing that it you do because you're it fits with the ethics of the organisation. And as Sean said, you're working with the culture of the organisation. You have a good speak up culture. You want your, your staff to come forward when they see things that are perhaps you know, moving the organization the wrong way, that risk the reputation, that risk damaging the organization that you're all there to support. And I think once we characterize whistleblowers as people giving their employer the gift of information, you know, that are trying to sort out wrongdoing before the, catching little risks before they become big risks, then we can start sort of pre preventing this kind of awful uh, characterization that Sharon's had about whistleblowing, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, recruit a whistleblower, they're just too much trouble. We need to stop that. Thank John, you how would you uh, go ahead? I was just about to call on you to ask how you would characterize the 
climate for whistleblowing in the U.S. these days? So I think we still we have a long way to go, um, but I do think that there are signs that things are improving. Um, you know, it's interesting, Sharon, talking about the, the term whistleblower. And when, you know, when I started at the office of the whistleblower at the SEC, there was a lot of questions about should we name it something else? You know, office of the truth tellers or the, the, the reporter <laughs> or whatever. Um, we ended up with this term and, and uh, you know, for better or worse, it still has a stigma attached to it. But here in the U.S., you know, there have been a number of ins high profile instances. Um, you know, Sharon was the, the, the person of the year unfortunately, after, you know, Rome had burned, but, you know, she got the recognition that she deserved. And, and historically, that seems to be a pattern that I, I'm a little confused by, and I'm hoping is changing, which is we celebrate whistleblowers after they've gone through all of the difficult times and when they turn out to be right. So, you know, Harry Markopoulos has had several mo movies made about him for blowing the whistle on Madoff. You know, the tobacco whistleblower has had movies and, 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 you know, Sharon's gotten a bunch of her well-deserved but what late arriving accolades for what they did and, and the, the her heroism that they showed, but we only see it after the fact. And what I'm hoping is happening now with high profile whistleblowers, like for example, the Facebook whistleblower uh, here in the US, uh, you know, she very publicly came out and, and was celebrated at, at, you know, in, in, the, in the moment that she was blowing the whistle, which is different than is typically happening. You know, we had in, in the prior administration, we had people coming forward about various things happening at the White House. And rather than, you know, uh, castigate those who came forward, there was a sense of this is a, a patriotic thing that is being done and being recognized at the time as something that is appropriate and something that we should encourage. That said, as I said, we've got a long way to go. And I think, you know, the proof is in you talk to whistleblowers, even very successful, financially rewarded whistleblowers. And I think that the story is most of them would say, if I knew then what I was going to go through, even knowing that I was going to get handsomely rewarded at the end, I wouldn't do it because of the, the problems it caused at home, uh, personal strife, professional issues, not being able to get a job. That's, that speaks volumes. You know, people who actually, you know, are quote unquote, being successful whistleblowers, if they knew what they were going to be put through by their employers, they wouldn't have gone down the road. We've got to change that. I think the program is helping to change that. Um, but and I, I do think that there are signs that people are recognizing whistleblowers for their contributions and not, uh, you know, as, as rabble rousers. Um, but we've got a long way to go. And maybe this is a good time to ask the question: Are there other countries <clears throat> that any of us know of which have an exemplary record on handling? Uh, whistleblowing corporate or, or government whistleblowing say and are there places where it's truly dangerous i mean life dangerous to people's life to take this stand you know 60 minutes just covered saudi arabia whistleblowers and obviously it's dangerous to their lives so that's not a place you want to go if you want to be a whistleblower uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's against the, it's a current it's a crime in switzerland and I know in, in, in places like China and Russia, uh, we have a, a lot of people reporting to the SEC, US SEC program um, because of the protections it offers. But in those countries, it's, it's, it's life threatening. Um, I have clients who, um, who are reporting on companies that uh, are US based that have overseas operations. And, and you know, one of the questions they ask me is what can you do to guarantee my physical safety? Because in this country, uh, you know, if, if, if they find out I've done this, I can be put in jail or worse. And so, uh, yeah, it's not uh, it universally, uh, there, there are widespread practices. Um, some countries more pro whistleblower than others, but some make it not only difficult, but an actual crime to report wrongdoing, which is, in my mind, an odd circumstance. Can I, yeah, yes. can I come in there? I mean, I think, I mean, I absolutely support what both previous speakers said about, you know, there are countries where it is not good, but I think across Europe, they've introduced a new whistleblowing directive, which could be a real game changer in how uh, whistleblowing is dealt with by the member states. So every member state now needs to introduce uh, laws to protect whistleblowers and every employer 
of 50 or more staff, so even quite small employers, have to introduce whistleblowing policies and arrangements, which mean that they investigate the concern and protect the whistleblower. And there need to be really dissuasive penalties for organizations and sometimes for individuals, including in some cases, they're introducing really significant fines uh, and potential imprisonment for for breaches of, um, you know, for people who are not protecting whistleblowers. So I think, sadly, in the UK, we don't have to implement the directive, which uh, means that where we once had, you know, some of the best protections in the world, we're now falling behind and our law needs updating. Um, but I think across Europe, there's going to be some really interesting changes. Um, and I think in Australia as well, they've got some, they've already introduced uh, the idea of, of criminal sanctions and so forth for people who, who don't treat whistleblowers uh, well. And I think some of those you know, deterrent effects of that could be powerful. Is there any prospect of a, yes, Floyd, go ahead and I'll come back. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was going to reinforce what uh, Elizabeth said. I, I also think that even though we are now out of Europe, the commercial agreements that take place between European countries and the UK means that we would have no option but to demonstrate an effective whistleblowing policy to give consistency to that whole transaction that will take place. And I just wanted to mention as well that um, I see that Dubai has also now launched the Dubai Financial Services Authority, uh, a new whistleblowing regime for um, those uh, companies that are registered within the uh, financial enclave in Dubai, and that is a uh, not surprising, but it's it's a welcome move in the right direction because of the not the sheer scale of transactions that take place there. Uh, I, I, listening to what all the other speakers um, Kate, uh, have said earlier, I think we also need to consider there's a there's a feeling that if we're not careful, we'll turn whistleblowers into bounty hunters. And um, especially uh, I note in the US where, uh, you know, whistleblowers have received sums of in excess of 250 million pounds, dollars in some, in some cases. If I looked at the old GlaxoSmithKline case, the Bank of America case, um, uh, and it's even more important that if we're going to get a global infrastructure, we can somehow understand that relationship between rewarding a whistleblower and, uh, and in fact uh, uh, making payments to them because of the detriment they're suffering, like career issues and uh, loss of employment and revenue that way. Uh, and I just wondered what the panel thought about that, really. Sean, uh, I have I'm very sorry, go strong ahead. feelings about it. Um, I have extremely strong feelings about the Dodd-Frank Award or Bounty Program. Um, Sorbanes-Oxley Act was a corporate legislation act that was passed in July of 2002 in the wake of the corporate collapses of that era, WorldCom, Enron, Health South. And it just did anti-retaliation protection for whistleblowers, and it was not effective. Um, there were whistleblowers within the Wall Street firms that complained about the subprime mortgage mess in 2005 and six. They got retaliated against, fired, demoted. They made claims, and nothing came of it because it was really misapplied. And as a result of that, the U.S. passed the Dodd-Frank Act and included much stronger whistleblower protections. It was an award program of 10 to 30 percent of SEC fines. It prescribed that this whistleblower program would be under the umbrella of the SEC and the SEC would report annually about it. And it has been a game changer. And I think when you look at this from um, a macro level, a 50,000 foot level, you want um, people who might manipulate their power, abuse their power, whether it's, you know, manipulating financial statements or in the case of, of um, you know, different labs and blood work, putting people's lives in danger, you, you want them to be concerned that whistleblowers will be effective and will shut them down because it curbs their activities. It makes them do the right thing. And yes, over a billion dollars has been paid to whistleblowers in the United States in the 10 years 
of the Dodd-Frank Office of the Whistleblower Program. And that is a large amount, but it has attracted lawyers in the support of, of whistleblowers. It makes it effective. And as a result, there's now academic research that companies that put in place a robust internal reporting mechanism that truly listen to internal whistleblowers. They have a higher return on equity. They have lower litigation costs. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're putting a check and balance in the system that has been very effective. And what we don't measure is how many corporations might have gone down the pathway of Enron or might have gone like you know Wirecard or others. But now with whistleblowing as a potential threat, um, companies listen, they correct course, and we're not measuring the disasters that have been averted because this powerful check and balance is in place. And it is powerful only because of the reward program that has attracted smart legal talent like Sean and Liz to the cause of the whistleblower. But thankfully, Liz has been doing it way before there were bounty programs. But it is very important to have that legal talent in the corner of the whistleblower. Liz. If I could come in here, yeah, I think this might be one of those places where actually uh, the system in the US does not easily translate to the UK, because as Floyd said, what we have in the UK is a system of compensation, and I'm absolutely with him that, you know, whistleblowers need to be compensated for everything that has happened to them, the losses, the career life, you know, the career damage, and so forth, and it does work. Uh, to some extent, I mean, just last month we had a district nurse who was uh, compensated uh, 460,000 pounds for the lot for an unfair dismissal because she'd blown the whistle. And that was a career long uh, impact that it was going to have on her. That's about half a million dollars to a district nurse. And I think the problem with the reward system is it, uh, as we see it in the UK, is it's very difficult to translate the um, reward as in a, uh, you know, the, taking a percentage of um, uh, an investigation's, um, you know, the, the, the fine that's been that's been levied, um, it doesn't easily translate into all the sectors in which whistleblowing might uh, apply. So we're really keen to keep whistleblowers to be, you know, be all whistleblowers being able to get adequately compensated through a tribunal system. Um, and, and just as with the reward system, it can have a deterrent effect. So in the UK, you can't measure the success of the uh, compensation system by just how many people get awarded in the tribunal. There's the whole settlement system that happens before you get there. Knowing that I could bring a claim opens the door for me to settle and quietly move on uh, with my employer. So um, we have reservations about whether rewards would actually work or, or change in the UK. And I think it's a different system, different culture and a different litigation uh, setup that we have here. Um, but I'm absolutely with you in that, you know, we've got to have deterrent and dissuasive uh, penalties for employers and we haven't got there yet in the UK. Sean. Sure. Um, so, and I don't mean this to be adversarial because I'm not, but um, I, I, I found it interesting when I was running the office, um, we had uh, some uh, folks from the UK regulatory um, process come and actually spent two or three weeks with us um, as we were literally we were just building the program and, and you know, uh, finding our way around and you know, we let this person, you know, basically work with us and see everything that we were up to. And uh, and ultimately, you know, why we thought this was a good idea and what we thought the, the future program was. And um, that person then went, went back overseas and, and they came out with a report that we didn't see that said basically there's no evidence that the program, that a program like ours that rewards whistleblowers with money would work. And uh, uh, I was disappointed that that would be a, the takeaway. But, um, and it, 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 it struck me, uh, and, and I've heard, it, language like this, you know, our, our country doesn't, uh, you know, our people aren't like that, you know, we, we, we don't need to be paid to do the right thing. And, you know, it's, it's different for maybe it's, it's okay for you Americans, but you know, our country, and I've heard this about the UK, I've heard it about Australia, and I'm always interested every year as, as, uh, as pointed out, the, the whistleblower office puts out a, a annual report. And one of the data points it puts out is where did people report from? And consistently, the UK and Australia are you know, in the top three of, of people uh, from outside the U.S. who report to the SEC whistleblower program uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. So uh, I, I find it 
uh, uh, interesting that uh, there's this notion that you know our culture doesn't support that kind of thing, or you know we, we our people don't do that. When the data suggests just the opposite. I mean, the U.S. is the only program that has it, so that's why people from the outside. And I never publicized the, the program outside the U.S. And we still got dozens and dozens of, uh, if not hundreds, of, of whistleblowers in, in countries outside the U.S. who who wanted to avail themselves of the protections and the opportunity to get paid. Uh, but to just amplify what Sharon said, I can tell you for sure that when I was uh, the head of the whistleblower office, there are at least two companies that are currently in business right now that had a whistleblower not stop their fraud, it was on the same scale as the Enron fraud, they would not be in business right now. They would be gone and their employees would have no place to work and people who invested in those companies would have lost everything. Uh, so we paid a, a couple of people uh, who saved companies from going the route of Enron. I, I can say that as a fact. And you know, Sharon mentioned that a billion dollars has been paid out to whistleblowers and that's an interesting dollar figure. But the more interesting and, and uh, the more, uh, I think evidence of what a, an effective program it is, is that over a billion dollars have been returned to wrong investors in connection with the 200 or so people who've been paid. Those cases, those 200 uh, in instances, the SEC was able to stop fraud and get over a billion dollars back into the pockets of people who were wronged by fraud. That's, that just tells you that the program works and it works the way it's supposed to. And I, I, I hope and, and I certainly advocate uh, when I'm asked to, uh, both in my role as the head of the office and now in, in private practice, that other countries uh, take a, a, a look at what the U.S. program has done and model it after, uh, after the U.S. so that there are opportunities worldwide for people to take advantage of being protected and being rewarded when they stop fraud from happening. And I, I don't think that anybody who has invested in a company would feel happy to know that there's somebody who knows wrongdoing is happening in that company and doesn't feel empowered to come forward. And then you lose, you know, the, the value of your investment because that person didn't have the opportunity uh, to come forward. So um, I, I think the, the program has shown, uh, unlike, you know, again, we were early days when the UK came through that the program, you know, couldn't work or, or wasn't workable. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, it works and, it, and it's, it's only going to continue to get stronger and better. And, and I think Canada has, has adopted, uh, Ottawa has adopted a program that, that rewards people financially. And so it's happening and, and we're, we're trying to get more attention uh, to it worldwide. I think what we would say is that we'd be happy to add that on top of what we've got, but not to replace what we've got, because I don't think that a whistleblower reward system is easily transferable to all the different kinds of whistleblowing in the public sector. Uh, you know, what do you put, what, what price do you put on the, you know, the nurse that saved a life because she raised a safeguarding concern in her hospital or, or whatever. I think it, I think it's, you know, we don't have a problem with regulators saying we're going to reward whistleblowers on top of what we've got. The idea that we I'm opposed to in the UK is that we would unpick pick the employment rights system that we have here that allows every whistleblower to go for compensation. And we did some research um, with YouGov uh, last year and found that uh, over 40% of people say they would raise the they would raise a whistleblowing concern regardless of the risk to them, and only 2% said they'd only do it if there was a financial reward. So I think perhaps, I mean, we could debate rewards and the different systems all day, but perhaps what's more important is, you know, people, people raise concerns because it's the right thing to do, and I think that's the kind of attitude that we all want to encourage in whatever way that is, whether it is through a reward system or through a deterrent system or through a penalty system, but we want to be encouraging the right behaviour, and what I would rather do is flip it and say, well, what are we doing to get employers to put in place the right cultures so we never have to go anywhere near the rewards and the tribute? We want to stop the wrongdoing soonest. And that's why whistleblowers, the eyes and ears inside an organisation can be the very first people uh, to identify when things are going wrong and should be listened to at the right at the outset, because I think that's where we're going. You know, if we get the right culture inside organisations. We don't need to be talking about the remedies at the end of the day. Floyd. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like... Uh... I'd just like to add to that, really. We, one of our MPs, uh, Kevin Hollingdrake, I think his name is, he said uh, to Parliament uh, as recent as a few months ago that his research had led him to the conclusion that, you know, 43% of all financial crimes that are prosecuted in the UK were uh, identified by whistleblowers and we don't have that 
reward system in place. Well, and and those are fantastic numbers. It does it it, it does show that people are willing to stand up and be counted. My concern as a as legal counsel for corporates is that we need to have in place, firstly, within organizations, a culture that tells people it's okay to expose wrongdoing, that um, trains them as to who to go to. So they are going to a, a specific individual or individuals that it can be managed in a way that they feel safe in doing so. As I say, that permeating the UK uh, employment culture at present is, is fear that once I do this, that's me done as far as that business is concerned, but equally I'm attracting some notoriety that's going to mean it's gonna be difficult to, to, to get another job. And that's what I meant, that we need to have um, preventative safeguards, not reactive compensation. And that in itself, if companies commit to doing that, will be the first step in ensuring that we don't have to call them whistleblowers anymore. I'm not quite sure that we, we could have a competition as to what we what we <laughs> should do for people who do this. But, you know, I don't think we should do that anymore. I also have some... Uh, grave concerns that in the employment sphere, individuals will uh, make disclosures that they hope will be identified as protected disclosures, because it's the equivalent of a bulletproof vest under the UK le employment legislative framework. So we've got to get the balance right. And we've got to make sure that the structure incorporates our law enforcement uh, agencies and our judicial system. So the evidence is right because a, a, a lot of harm can be done by disclosures which subsequently turn out not to be well founded. Before we move on to uh, the questions from uh, listeners, uh, Sharon, I want to be sure to get to this question with you. What is the climate within business schools? You're, in a very, you're involved with a very distinguished business school in North Carolina. It has, has it changed over time? Is, is whistleblowing something that is like walking on eggshells in a business school or is it, is it a celebrated tradition? Um, I would say that there's just so much more material to cover. In the last 20 years since Enron's collapse, of course there's Enron, WorldCom, now Francis Hogan at Facebook, um, Theranos, you had Tyler Schultz and Erica Chung um, whistleblowing within that organization. Of course, Jeffrey Wigan from tobacco, you know, from before Enron. Um, but you, you end up with great case studies and a lot of interest on whistleblowing, but also on the corporations that are doing it correctly, you know, that have really put in the right systems um, we talk about storytelling um, and how CEOs that really want to have a culture, a speak up culture, they praise the, un, you know, the unspoken, unnamed internal whistleblower that brought up a concern and what was said. You know, they tell corporate stories of, um, you, know, of you know, of the good, good activity of internally blowing the whistle. Um, it's looked at positively. The actions are discussed and praised. Um, the person isn't named, um, but it it is something that I think is on the on definitely part of um, MBA programs, business ethics programs, in a much larger scale than it was um, two decades ago. Thank you. Um... I, before we do turn this back over to Mike Scott, I just want to ask you all quickly whether you feel, hearing the, shall we say, slight difference in emphasis between the UK and the US on some of these points, what does it make you think about the prospects for some sort of international convention, perhaps with the help of the United Nations or some other international organization, Transparency International, I don't know. Uh, what are the prospects for some standard international treaties regimes on this, Liz? 
Well, it took a long time to get the European Union to agree on its whistleblowing directive, but I think that will now be uh, a really good model that other countries can follow. There is recently an international, the ISO have put out standards so that all employers can now uh, look at an international standard about what the kind of questions they should be asking their organisation about. How do I know that my organisation's got good and effective whistleblowing arrangements? So it sets out the kind of things that they want to see. Um, beyond that, I think there are always going to be, you know, cultural differences and, and difficulties about um, addressing some of the issues we talked at the beginning. You know, we've got a long, you know, we've got some countries where whistleblowing is, is a long way from being accepted and normalised in the way that Sharon was saying. Um, you know, and so, so we've got to take people on a journey. I'm not sure we're going to be ready for an international um, standard. But then, then again, there are a lot of places where, as you say, they have Transparency International working across the world. We've got the Tishwani principles, which are international principles around uh, public interest whistleblowing when it comes to official secrets and so forth. So I think there are some. Maybe we need to work harder at publicising them as well. Sure. I do think that there's a challenge to come up with a universal that, that one size fits all. Um, and, you know, I think this point is well taken. Um, I do think it lends itself to principles or, or an agreement of standards. Um, but I think it would be very difficult to come up with something that works in every culture and, and with every different um, um, atmosphere. Um, but I know that there are, you know, high level principles that, that you know, I think would be helpful if, every, if, if in some kind of treaty fashion, you know, we could all agree, you know, to Floyd's point, uh, it's really important that uh, employers understand that there's a value to people, if, you know, and every company in the U.S. has some version of, you know, if you see something, say something. Um, you have to mean that. You have to have it. So if we can come up with some, you know, agreement that you know, employers, when they encourage their employees to, when they see something, to say something, they won't have bad things happen to them. And, you know, Sharon's... Uh, um, experience, unfortunately, is not unusual that people come forward and they think, I'm going to be the employee of the year and they're going to give me a free parking space for life. And then it turns out, that, you know, <laughs> instead, bad things happen to them and, and they get fired or they get marginalized or they're, they're ignored. Um, so I do think that there are, there are some universal concepts that, that could apply uh, across the, the globe. Um, but then I think allowing different countries to implement them in ways that fit their culture makes some sense. Um, but I do think, you know, something equivalent of, you know, the, the Ten Commandments or something like that. And, you know, just we all agree that certain things are true. And then, you know, letting each country kind of implement them in, in, in the way that makes sense um, is a goal that we should strive for. Mike, over to you. Hi, thank you. A very interesting uh, conversation being going on. Uh, Francis Jukasatis says this. Whistleblower sounds neutral, like the referee acting according to rules objectively. But whistleblowers are participants acting without any authority other than their own conscience. Is there a better word for whistleblower? Amateur spy, judge, jury? Who would like to take that? Well, Elizabeth, you're smiling, so yes. Yeah, we often have this debate with employers, you know, is, is the whistleblower the right language to use? Does it have pejorative terms? I think we've come an awful long way in the last 20 years in characterising whistleblowers so that the public absolutely understand and respect, as Sharon was saying before, they've got the public respect. Um, they haven't always got their own employer's respect, but I think we've come a long way. So I'm very happy with the term whistleblowing and I think we should be normalising it. But when we talk to organisations, we say we don't actually mind what you call your policy or your arrangements, call it speak up, speak out, whatever you like, whatever fits with your culture but make sure that you're encouraging people to raise concerns with you because that's the best and cheapest form of risk assessment. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, there's huge business benefits for getting this right. Sharon, what do you think? Well, it's, as Sean mentioned, they, they probably had quite a lot of professionals look at what else can we call this program other than Office of the Whistleblower. Um, uh, it, we're just kind of stuck with that term and we've got to hopefully just, um, I think it's come a long way. I don't think it's toxic as it used to be. I think there are people viewing it as um, 
you know, a check and balance, a gatekeeper, preventing abuses of power. I think we've got to change attitudes about the term because there just doesn't seem to be a, a better term to use. Floyd? Well, it's not as sexy, but uh, I, I think protected disclosure uh, would be an indication of the activity that they're engaging in. Uh, but I, I, I readily admit it's not catchy. Sean. Yeah, a part of the problem too is, at least in, in the US program, um, it covers a wide variety of kinds of people. So it's not just the internal uh, person who sees wrongdoing. Um, you, uh, you have your Harry Marco Polis types who are experts in a particular field and they see something on Toward going on by a competitor. And those people are, you know, are allowed to be whistleblowers under the US program. Um, so I think you could come up with, I think, you know, Floyd's suggestion of a uh, protected disclosure person or something like that is 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 is, is, is it, it's descriptive it's not a bumper sticker worthy but it's, it's descriptive um but that only covers a certain you know the people who are blowing whistle on their own companies and the, the, the term is, is broader but um you know i mentioned this you know when, when i joined the sec we were actively discussing is there another word we can or should use and we really never came up with one that captured everything that we we're trying to the message we're trying to send to the universe of people we wanted to feel empowered to come forward if they thought something was going wrong. Thank you. There's uh, someone who's just said that RK, uh, RK says, uh, how can we protect and help employees before they turn to whistleblowing? So, Roy, do you I, want I, to start with that one? Yeah, yes, I, uh, absolutely. I think. I, I sort of introduced the concept because I, I, I believe that um, more often than not, and I'd like to hear what Liz has to say on this, Elizabeth has to say on this, but more often than not, um, people disclose out of frustration uh, because, and sometimes people disclose out of fear, they disclose for all sorts of reasons. What I'm advocating is companies committing to training their employees as to what amounts to a protected disclosure and the circumstances in which it will, will be protected and uh, to encourage them to bring information to a specified internal person uh, at the start where all the opportunities can be explored and safeguards put in place for them. That's, that, that's, what I would like to see, because it in, encourages confidence. And of course, the more information that businesses can get a hold of and preventing uh, a whistleblower from having to go externally to make the disclosure, the, the better off everyone is. I just absolutely support that piece around the training. It is so important that we train our managers to be receivers of bad news because mostly with whistleblowing, whatever your motive is, and I don't think motive matters, often with whistleblowing, you are raising something that is inherently criticism. Something's gone wrong. Somebody's got it wrong. It's going to, it's difficult news as an employer to hear. Uh, you know, we need to train managers to recognize when it's a whistleblowing concern and to deal with it appropriately, whether that's escalating it or dealing it with it themselves. And we did some research because there is this kind of myth that whistleblowers are those kind of persistent people who just keep on banging on about this issue until they've uh, got the answer that they want. Well, actually, that isn't true because the research we did at just looking at whistleblowing in financial services found that only 30% of whistleblowers would raise their concern more than once. So the message for employers is you've got a really small window to get this right, to get the right response to the whistleblower and to, uh, to recognize that as a concern, to thank the whistleblower, to tell them what you're gonna to do to protect the whistleblower and so forth. There are some very sophisticated uh, teams of whistleblowing in, in uh, companies in the UK where they have uh, they introduce risk assessments right at the start. When a whistleblower comes in, they assess the risk, they involve the whistleblower in that discussion, and they monitor the risk throughout the whistleblowing journey. Because whistleblowing isn't just a one-off act, I've raised my concern and off I go. It's often a very lengthy process, as I'm sure Sharon will, will acknowledge. 
The other thing I'd say is if you're a whistleblower, what can really help is getting early advice. And that's what we have on our advice line at Protect. We advise people not just on their employment rights when it's all gone horribly wrong, but also on how to best raise the concern at least risk to them. So if you phrase your concern in a way that doesn't bring you into conflict with your employer, the chances of you being safe and the concern being listened to can increase. So early advice for the whistleblower and absolutely right, the training for organizations is crucial. I think uh, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I agree 100% uh, training and, and empowering uh, employees, uh, making sure that they know what their rights are uh, is, is critical. Uh, I think Sharon will agree with me. My, my recollection is that uh, Enron got A plus ratings for all of their internal ethics training. And they have you know, a, a board that you know, had shining members of society. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not it's not the policy, it's not the training, it's what do you do? You know, culture matters, tone at the top matters. I worked for three major companies in between my stints at the SEC, and so I know of what I speak. Um, employees watch and pay attention to how people are treated when they say something. And if everybody, you know, every company has a, a code of ethics that says, you know, we want to be the kind of place where you feel empowered to come and talk to us. Um, and if you think that your employees aren't paying attention when someone actually does it and what happens to them, then you're not, you're missing the boat. Um, if everybody who, you know, in good faith comes forward and says something and every single one of them doesn't work there within a couple of weeks or gets demoted or is sent somewhere else. And if you think your employees aren't paying attention, aren't talking about these things, then you're really not paying attention. Um, so following through on what you say, the training is great. Having all the systems in place is great but how you deliver on what you are saying is the most important way to make your, if you want to be a company that, that really doesn't want your employees to come to me so that I can get them to the SEC, the best thing for you to do is to be the kind of company that when a person raises their hand, it is known throughout the company that that person was treated properly and with respect, even if it turns out that their information was unfounded, at least they were heard, they were treated with respect and nothing bad happened to them because they raised their hand. And unfortunately, and fortunately for my business, that not, not enough companies do that. So I get a, a, a number of people who are not happy with the way that companies have handled it. But following through on your promises is, 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 is really the way to put people like me out of business. I, I couldn't agree more with Sean's comments. And it's very subtle. Um, it doesn't take much for the wrong message to be delivered. Um, so it, it, you know, Companies are a bit like children watching their parents. They will, they will understand what gets rewarded and what gets punished very, very quickly. And your choice of wording in, in your everyday conversation um, says a lot too. Eddie Aitchies um, takes this a little bit further, I think, when, and, uh, when he asks, the stronger public unions are, the better whistleblowers are protected. These include those outside the bargaining unit. As to the UAE, unions are not allowed. Would you like to comment, he, sa he says. Floyd, because you raised the UAE, I think. Um, <laughs> I think, looking at unions in, in, in the, their strict habitats, they are about reinforcing existing rights. They look at collective bargaining and they stand in defense of employees who are facing some form of unfair treatment. They act as representatives. Uh, uh, I, th I think the phenomenon of whistleblowing and informing your employer about misdeeds. It comes at it from a slightly different angle. And I'm not persuaded that uh, being a member of a union would enhance the uh, position of a whistleblower. In the UK, for instance, uh, although I mentioned earlier on in this discussion that the protection is reactive, the Employment Rights Act does contain a provision that any dismissal for whistleblowing is automatically unfair and it's not subject to any time qualification as, as other employment 
um, infringements are. So uh, I, I don't think unions could do any more to assist where we are in our whistleblowing framework at this point in time. And I don't think they're part of the global um, solution. Sorry, um, I think Elizabeth wants to. Yeah, I think it's really interesting in the UK that they're not seen as part of the solution for whistleblowing. I mean, sometimes that is difficult because inside a union, you might be representing both the whistleblower and the person who is being, you know, who the allegations are against, and that puts them in a difficult position. But generally, you're thinking, you know, you think that whistleblowing would be better, there'd be safety in numbers. You know, if, if a union was able to, to join up some whistleblowers and bring forward concerns on behalf of the whistleblowers, not only do you have the protection of not knowing who the whistleblower necessarily is, but you'd have that kind of safety in numbers and it'd be much harder for an organisation to pick them off. And unions have a number of roles, as Floyd set out, you know, they should be involved in, in helping to uh, employers to set the policies for their organisations and to make sure those policies are being implemented and to be training staff and training their union reps on how to support a whistleblower that comes to them. But I think we have a slightly, um, you know, we, we have not a huge amount of union involvement in the whistleblowing sphere in the UK. And I'm, I'm not ever quite sure why that is, because it seems to me there's a potential there that is just untapped. Something to do with uh, confidence uh, to be able to do something uh, against a powerful organization, whether that be businesses, which we've tended to, to concentrate on, or other areas. Might come back to that if we have, have chance in a moment. But Angela Preston, hello, Angela, always loyal in giving us a, a really good question. Uh, thank you for that. Based on your knowledge, says Angela, what advice would you offer for someone who is thinking of blowing the whistle? Let's say now. What advice would you would you give them? Sharon. Well, I do this all the, all the time, right? This is part of what I do is people come and they're thinking about reporting. And, and you know, my job is to make sure that they understand what they're getting themselves into, both in terms of what could happen to them, in terms of how long it's going to take, and and a candid assessment of you know their their opportunity to to succeed. Um, and then I want to listen. Um, mostly, I, I try to listen to what is important to people who are thinking about doing this. And I have, on several occasions, advised a person that in your situation where you want to be guaranteed that no one will ever find out that you blew the whistle, that you probably shouldn't do it. And, and you know, you've got kids and you've got a job. There's no legal requirement that you do this. And in your circumstance, it's probably not the best thing for you. Now, that's business going out of my door, but I think it's really important for us who represent whistleblowers to represent them and, and meet their needs and make sure that they understand what they're getting into before they do it. And, and I, I sleep better at night knowing that someone, uh, I counsel someone not to blow the whistle because what I heard from them is they can't afford to lose their job. And you know they want uh, ironclad guarantees that you know they won't be outed or that the company won't figure out it was them. And I can't give those. And if that's what you want, then, then maybe this is not a path for you to go down. Um, but it's, you know, it's, I think it's absolutely critical that, uh, that they understand that this is an, a long-term undertaking, that there are implications both for their current jobs and maybe for their future employment prospects. Um, and, and only when we get to a point where, okay, I understand that, I understand the risks, uh, I still think that this is something that needs to be reported because I want it stopped. And I, I have to tell you, and this is not Pollyannish, by far, the majority of, of my clients say, I just want this to get stopped. You know, I'm glad that there's an opportunity I can get paid at the end of the day. And I have to always give the caveat, you know, thousands of people reported, only hundreds have been paid, a lot of money, um, but it's not, there's no guarantees here. And, and uh, the, for the most part, the people who decide to go forward, it's not because I've given them any assurances that they're gonna get paid, but it's because they really think that something is wrong and it needs to be stopped. And you know, as long as they understand all all that the potential implications, uh, we go forward. Um, but I, the last thing I ever want to do is have a client tell me 
you know, five, six months later, a year later, you never told me that this could happen or that could happen. Make sure that everybody goes in with it with their eyes open. Um, and then only when we all agree, then we move forward. And, and uh, I, would, I would actually use everything that Sean just said in my example as to, you know, the, the wonderful, you know, collateral benefits almost from the Dodd-Frank Act whistleblower program. If you were to Google whistleblower legal help in the U.S., there are probably over a dozen firms that pop up. And you know, luckily you, you, you hope you run into someone like Sean that's gonna give you um, great advice. But for the most part, you're going to find lawyers that have been in this space for the last several years, working with whistleblowers, with the SEC program, with all that that entails. And I will say that when I was in the middle of my whistleblowing at Enron, I had different friends say, you need, you need to talk to a lawyer, you need to talk to a lawyer. Well, I, I, it took me three lawyers um, and nobody was really, you know, that I talked to was experienced in this space and they had a hard time believing me. So actually, you know, being able to speak to a lawyer with experience in this space saves the sanity of a would-be whistleblower. And quite often they're being listened to, they're being treated as a credible person. Um, and that helps them even discuss what's going on because their spouse might have said, oh, honey, you always make mountains out of mohills. You know, don't say anything. We've got our family to protect. Um, you know, you, they haven't been able to be listened to. And, and I can't tell you how important it is to be able to have a sounding board to discuss your concerns with someone that, that has expertise and experience. Elizabeth, That's really powerful. Sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to sort of echo that, that, you know, that's exactly a protect. We do look at both the individual, what the risks are to them and the, and the uh, public interest concern, because as Sharon said, it can be an extremely lonely, isolating um, experience. And I'll go back to I'll go back to something that uh, Sharon said right at the beginning that uh, she came from the Lutheran background. Of course, Martin Luther had to have a lot of courage to do what he did because he wasn't just being uh, sentenced uh, uh, to a punishment in this life. He was being sentenced to punishment for eternal damnation. You know that was real courage with a whistleblower. You know. And, and, and whistleblowers do have to have, have courage. There's one area that we haven't spoken of yet, and I deliberately didn't ask, ask this question from Roman, uh, Rosemary Galley for a while, because I think Sandy wants just to, to uh, say a few words about this. Because Ro Rosemary says, how does the panel characterize Julian Assange? Was he a whistleblower? Sandy, do you want to say anything about Julian uh, Assange? Thank you, Mike. Yes, that's very much on many of our minds at the moment because the authorities in the UK have now said that he can be extradited to the United States. He's an unpopular person in the US, um, in part because of some of his personal behavior throughout all this. And some feel he tried to take credit from other people who deserved it more. Um, but uh, the great worry in this country is that um, he is really going to be seen legally in the court system as parallel to a reporter, a journalist, a correspondent who is doing his job and receiving information that is unauthorized because that ultimately is what Julian Assange did was to receive classified secret information and then circulate it. So I think a lot of people who don't happen to like him personally are going to find themselves in a position to have to defend him because otherwise uh, a lot of journalistic traditions in this country are liable to be gutted, particularly given some of the tendencies in the courts at the moment. That's a very particular dilemma and it's going to be upon us probably in the next few months. Well, yeah, okay. Do you want to say how we're going to handle it with our series? <laughs> well, let's let's see. We're we're hoping to have a conversation about that very soon because it's a, a really important time. And it's a huge free speech issue. 
for, for my project. And uh, it's a challenge, of course, to separate the personality from the deed and, and the potential punishment. Uh, so I, I'm, we're hoping to convene a good discussion of this. There are a few details to be worked out in advance of his actually being returned to the United States. Well, I, okay. I think WikiLeaks is what is what he really, you know, created, correct? Yes, and that's, that's to correct. The whistle, you know, in a leak format. It's still a tool for those without power to discuss abuses by those with power. So I come out uh, favorably towards him. That's just my opinion. Well, I understand. It's just that there may be some journalistic organizations that are reluctant to identify with him and to, to defend him. I think they'll change their minds pretty quickly, but that's still a concern. Floyd, have you, have you any view on this? Well, I, I just wondered whether, uh, and I'm fully supported, supportive of disclosure of misdeeds, but I just wonder whether there is a balance to be struck between information uh, that requires protection for the good of society as a whole and the world as a whole, um, whether those safeguards uh, should simply be swept away in support of free speech, where in fact we see from the WikiLeaks episode that they are um, operatives in other countries whose lives then become forfeit because of those disclosures. So uh, uh, that that's something that's worth exploring uh, about is there a greater public interest in protecting and safeguarding that data? Um, and that should that rank beyond the public interest of disclosure and free speech? That's That would be my observation. Well, Floyd, you certainly put one of the issues in the Assange case very clearly. Sean, any any comments on that? You know, it's a it's a multifaceted question, and it's it's on the one hand, you know, there's there's a, a Machiavellian aspect of it in my mind that um, do the ends justify the means, and and I, you know, with with Assange and with Snowden. Um, you know, they shone a light on some things that needed to have light shined on them. And so in that, in that sense, there's, there's good there. And the, the, the question, and, and Floyd raises it, I mean, not everything that is, that is confidential needs to have a light shown on it. And, you know, and who's the arbiter, you know, who, who makes the judgment as to, you know, this is going to be, this information is good and it's good that the public knows it so that changes can happen. Um, and, and on the other hand, no, that's something that actually ought not to be known um, for for obvious reasons. I, I so I find myself I've, I've been asked this question a lot about you know how do I feel about Assange and, and Snowden, and it's it, it's it, it's I don't think it, it fits easily into a one size fits all answer. I think um, a, a lot of good is going to come out of some of the information that's and 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 some good has already happened. Um, but, and, and, you know, to Sandy's point, you know, the personalities involved certainly do sometimes drive how you feel about and how, and how one comports themselves, you know, can cloud the way you think about it. Um, but, you know, so this is a long way of saying I don't really know what I think about it. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mixed in, in, uh, in my thoughts, um, but I do think having uh, ability for people to shine a light on, on things that are really important that that, that, that there are means to do that. Um, but I'm, I'm not one to say that I know and I'd be a good person to say, okay, you can do it, you shouldn't do it. You know, I'm not sure who, who has that ultimate authority. Um, but, but it does raise some concerns of mine when people just randomly turn over things uh, without giving a whole lot of thought to it and, and having the ability with a click of a button to expose a lot of things um, does have uh, some concerns and I just don't know how you filter it. Well, Mike, just to conclude on this, Sean also raises some very important issues at the heart of it. Of course, part of it is in the digital age, there's much less time to think about these things, there's much less time to weigh the merits. Um, it's always important to remember that 
after Daniel Ellsberg gave the New York Times the Pentagon Papers, the New York Times took three months with armed guards in the hotel room, uh, examining the papers, deciding what to do. Uh, in the case of WikiLeaks and the Snowden disclosures, it was a very much shorter condensed period of time. And it's possible that some mistakes were made. Today, people would be lucky to have three hours uh, to make decisions. Maybe some are made in three minutes. And uh, there are big issues at stake and we haven't really come up with a, a very good way to handle the, the equities all around. But the Assange case is gonna prompt some very important discussions about this. Fine. Well, um, thank you all very much. I'm going to hand it back to Sandy before I, I close close up the program. So, Sandy. Well, just quickly, I want to thank everybody who participated today. This was really a, a great and enlightened conversation and one of our favorite kinds, if I can speak for Mike and myself, where everybody doesn't just agree on every little nuance and detail, but but we get the sense of these transboundary issues and how differently they may be treated in some cases. And I do wanna say Sharon is somebody who is admired by very, very many people for what she did. And we're very honored that she agreed to participate in, in this program. Uh, we appreciate the support that we get of the Free Speech Project from Georgetown University and especially from the Knight Foundation and uh, we hope to use that support in our onward activities to underline our nonpartisan, non ideological framework for discussing these truly important free speech issues. So thank you all today. Mike. Well, yes, I'd like to, uh, to thank you. Thank you, Sean, Elizabeth, Floyd, Sharon, uh, Sandy, of course. What a great, great uh, discussion that we've had. Um, it's been an interesting debate. Uh, we hope to have a, another debate um, in August. Uh, we'll be announcing what that's on in, in, uh, in due course, but uh, hopefully it might be taking some of the issues that we've been talking about today a little further. My thanks also to the Georgetown uh, uh, authorities who, uh, who support these, these series that we put on. Also to the authorities at Oxford, at Campion Hall, to uh, Dr. Nick Austin, uh, to Trudy Preston and Ying Ying uh, Companion Hall uh, administrators, um, uh, and to uh, people at, at, uh, at Blackfriars, to John O'Connor, the regent, and to Richard Finn, the director of the Las Casas Institute. My thanks to uh, John McCabe and Jan Fusen and colleagues at Georgetown who've helped administer this, to Laura Lees in, in the UK, who's my publicist, uh, and to Maggie Scott uh, for for their help in, in putting all of this together. I'd like to thank everyone who have asked questions. Uh, there were really great questions today and got a good debate. I think we got through most of the questions, but if we haven't and there are burning issues, uh, we might be able to email them uh, answers to you, or you might find that we're going to be talking about this a little bit more in a, in a, later, in a later discussion. So thank you all for attending today, uh, for, your, for your support of our various series, uh, and especially uh, our thanks to Sandy, the director of the speech project at Georgetown. I'm Professor Michael Scott, fellow and senior deans at, dean at Blackfriars Hall, uh, Oxford. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike Scott Prof. Until the next time, take care, keep safe, especially in this very hot weather, um, and see you again. Bye bye. Thanks.